man who needs really no introduction, Dr. Sheehan, the program director from LSU, and he'll tell us about open aneurysm repair. All right, based on my experience with all of you yesterday, this is a lecture you desperately need. So <laughs> let's see what happens here. All right, so uh, last year I became aware that uh, Dr. Lumsden puts all these up on YouTube. Um, hopefully this one will be heavily edited. Uh, I became aware of this not because I was Googling myself, but my, uh, my son and my nephew Connor uh, found it because they have some YouTube channel where they do ridiculous things like play Minecraft and get hundreds of views. So uh, they came across my video uh, from 2016 and were laughing at my paltry 65 views. So I felt pretty bad about myself. Um, but then I saw my friend Jason Lee only had 24 views. But unfortunately my wife had uh, many, many more than both of us put together. So I still felt pretty bad about myself. So this year, I'm hoping, well, Dr. Lumsden's going to give me some kind of cutting edge talk, and this will go viral around the world, and all kinds of interventionists will watch it. And of course, I got open AAA, uh, the dying uh, breed. There we go. <laughs> Delayed response. All right. So the question is, where did this person train? Uh, with these numbers and the answer is not where but when and so this is me and this is 2001 So we don't get numbers like this anymore Boston was a very conservative place when I trained there it, I'm sure the people who finished there now don't don't look like this But that's what I finished with clinical one clinical year and we had a lot of aneurysms uh, You guys aren't going to see these numbers anymore uh, Unless you train in a weird place like Louisiana, you probably will see one or two I'm really struggling with this clicker. Can we do anything with the, maybe that. So when you look at uh, numbers of open aneurysms that the fellows do, uh, they're actually quite small. Uh, EVAR numbers have gone up, um, hovering right now around 50, but the, uh, <laughs> it's very lagging. Uh, the TVAR numbers um, have also gone up. We used to you know, finish with four or five. Now most people finish with between 15 and 20. But um, you know the open numbers just aren't there anymore. And the reason is, as you just saw in the last talk, we have a lot more enthusiasm for using these stent grafts, um, both on and off the IFU. So uh, we hope that when we institute the integrated residency, and now we had five years to get a hold of you, these numbers would be better. But indeed, they're about the same. Um, you just aren't seeing open aneurysms anymore. Um, so how we're going to address this as a, as a specialty remains to be seen, but it didn't hold out. So even, even now that we train you for five years, uh, we, we're just not, uh, we're not able to get you the, the open aneurysm numbers. So there's some ideas out there about making aneurysm specialty centers and, and what exactly we're gonna do. But the truth of the matter is with the tools you're being given today, you'll probably have to do very, very few of these anyway. Um, and so here we stand. So how do we teach you? Uh, if we can't teach you in the OR, um, Yesterday you saw the, basically the two ways. So we have this um, static model, which we can perfuse, but in, in general, nobody learns how to expose an aorta with this kind of model, right? So that's why we separated it out. So this model will teach you how to suture because the place you don't want to learn how to suture is in the OR. You want to go to the OR, because if you show up in the OR and all you know how, <laughs> and you don't know how to suture, that's what the attending is going to teach you. But if you show up with full mastery of suturing, then you'll learn the important parts of surgery, which is dissection and how to set it up. So we can't teach you with this model how to do that. So the really only model that has enough fidelity is cadavers. So cadavers, that, that's really the only model that has enough fidelity to teach you exactly how to um, expose the, the aorta. Um, so that's why we spent quite a bit of time doing that yesterday. And that's one of the reasons why we don't do the suturing on the cadavers, um, because we're trying to get everybody as much time as we can learning how to dissect, and then we teach you how to suture in kind of a more stable environment. Go ahead. All right, so screening is important to talk about with, with AAAs, and who do we screen and why? And right now we have the SAVE Act, which gives us uh, authorization for men, women. Uh, in this age, with history of tobacco use, women, they have to have a first-degree relative. Um, but basically, you want somebody who you're going to be able to treat. That's the whole point of screening. It's not to find aneurysms. It's to find aneurysms that are worthy of treating. 
Uh, so here, this is our uh, local screening group. So we screened last year, we screened 1,000 veterans uh, in New Orleans. And when you screen, you want to find that population where you're going to get a good percent. You're aiming between 5 8% positive. Uh, and again, these are people who should generally be healthy enough to fix. Um, you can keep going. I have a lot of slides. So when you screen them, then you have to know what to do with them. So our general guidelines are here. Um, I tend to bring people in more often. The reason is the longer your follow-up period of time, the less follow-up there is. People forget. People can't make appointments a year ahead. So I generally bring people in about every six months, even if I'm not doing an ultrasound, just to talk to them, let them know they're still part of the system. What we're seeing in the United States is that with um, open repair and going down and with surveillance going up, our mortality rate from aneurysm rupture is actually dropping. But we can't extend that to small aneurysms. The UK trial, a lot of these trials showed that, you know, when we find small aneurysms, there is no benefit to early fix. But over time, if they live long enough, most of them do come to be the size of repair. So especially when we're using things with limited um, longevity, like EVARs, which have, a, you know, a higher rate of... Uh, of reoperation and reintervention in open aneurysms, there's really no benefit, survival benefit to getting them early. So, you got somebody with an aneurysm, what do you do? Well, you tell them to quit smoking because a lot of them are smokers. And then when do you fix it? And these numbers are, are not from any kind of randomized controlled trial, really. We have the small uh, aneurysm trial from the UK now, but you know it was, it was based on some um, pretty sketchy science in, in the beginning because nobody ever did a trial where we just didn't fix aneurysms and watched them rupture. So we estimate that this is really the time to fix. So as, a, as men, as approach is 5.5, women it's 5. Does anybody know the actual only anatomic landmark you can use to um, judge you know, uh, an aneurysm based on the body habitus of the person? You know, Because people are big, they're small, but there's one anatomic landmark you can you can kind of use as a uh, as an anchor to see how big the aneurysm really is. It's, what's that? Vertebral body. Good. Yeah. So that's exactly right. So that's the only thing that's kind of stable relative to the size of aneurysm at predicting rupture. But most people just take these general uh, things. So saccular aneurysms are interesting, right? We were always kind of taught, oh, you fixed them early, but that's not really based on any science either. There's no big trials of saccular aneurysms seeing when they rupture. We just know that they have an irregular shape and therefore we assume they have irregular predictability. So we fix them early because we don't know really what the rupture risk is, but most science seems to support actually waiting for them to be about five centimeters as well. Go ahead. So when you get the person in, what you have to do in addition to you know sizing up that aneurysm is look for other aneurysms. So you wanna at least check their popliteals uh, minimum physical exam, if not an ultrasound, and make sure they've had a recent chest x-ray so there's no massive thoracic aneurysm that, you, that you're not seeing. So this kind of harkens back to the last talk, and so all of our indications for doing open are all the indications against doing endo. Um, but again, the, these are kind of becoming rarer and rarer. Uh, we have figured out ways to get around all of this. Uh, the things that you know still would give me pause are mycotic aneurysms. Um, you know, people do stent them, but they, they seem to have a pretty high risk of, uh, of infection. All the other anatomic features we've been able to kind of get around. Um, so you have to do things when you do open aneurysm repair that you're probably not used to. We actually hold Plavix. Um, not everybody does, but I still do. If you've ever been retroperitoneum, gotten into some uncontrolled bleeding, you would, uh, you would remember to hold the Plavix as well. Um, we tell them this, even just two weeks of smoking cessation improves mortality. We hold the ACE inhibitors. These are all these old-fashioned things we have to do on every patient. And even a Swan-Gans catheter, you can look that up in a book, but we sometimes use these if we're expecting major hemodynamic disturbance. Um, how you expose it, yesterday, most of you wanted to do the thoraco-abdominal exposure, uh, but for, for the most part, if we're doing an infrarenal or juxtarenal AAA, we do a midline uh, exposure. Rich peritoneal is beneficial. Uh, especially if you have an inflammatory aneurysm, horseshoe kidney, hostile aneurysm, maybe they have a stoma, um, or somebody with severe pulmonary disease. People with retroperitoneal incisions tend to do better from a pulmonary standpoint. Go ahead. Um, so I was always taught to clamp right at the aortic neck first. Uh, what uh, most textbooks will tell you is clamp the least disease vessels first. The risk of clamp is the risk of embolization. So if the iliacs are, are less diseased, then you clamp those first and then clamp the aortic neck. I clamp the aortic neck first. I don't think it makes a tremendous difference. Um, 
you want to do your anastomosis as close to the renals as you can. Failures of open repair are generally recurrence, and it's a recurrence of the uh, kind of the juxtarenal segment of the, of the uh, aorta. So if you can get your graft as close as you can in the kidneys, you'll eliminate that area. Uh, tube, you know, they, the, historically 50% were done with a tube graft. Now, you know, we're always doing complex aneurysms, so a lot of these do, uh, involve complex iliac anatomy, so we're doing a lot of bifurcated. What I would Im implore you, if for some reason you're doing an open repair and it's a rupture, I would put a tube graft in, regardless of really what the iliacs look like, unless they were ruptured too. You wanna, your mortality rate is so high for ruptures, you wanna get in and get out as quickly as possible. If you can sew a tube graft in, and then you can deal with the iliacs later, even, you know, an endovascular cuff later on. Um, Aero by femme is less favored because highest rate of complication once you go into the groins, you get infections, pseudoaneurysms, things like that. And you want to perfuse at least one hypogastric, and it's for three reasons. One is for the bowel, uh, two is for buttock or pelvic ischemia, and three is for spinal cord perfusion. So you always want to make sure that you can at least perfuse one hypogastric at the end, similar to when you're doing endo. What's the collateral to the hypogastric? Contralateral hypogastric? What is it? It's the profunda, right? So the profunda, the ipsilateral profunda is the collateral to the major collateral the hypogastric. So if you are in a situation where you're wondering about your perfusion, you want to check out your profunda anatomy. So how everybody does these things a little bit differently, what I like to do is kind of sweep all the bowel up, and it really will be your duodenum uh, right overlying the aorta. So I mobilize the duodenum even before I put any retractors in, just kind of mobilize the duodenum, get it all off the... Uh, the aorta, and then I use an Omni. Uh, they had fancier ones. It's sad when uh, somebody's anatomy lab has fancier instruments than I've got in my OR, but that's the reality I'm living in. So uh, once your retractors are in, everything, you, you have what you know we call a box that, that you're looking at the aorta. And the top of the box is the renal vein. And so the left renal vein crosses the aorta, usually right where the renal arteries are. And there's some important collateral. So most of us, we looked at this yesterday in the lab. And you have, to, you have to kind of make up your mind early on. Do I want full mobility of the renal vein or do I want the possibility of ligating it? And the possibility of ligating it is if there's an injury. So you can go in and you can fully mobilize it and you can tie off the gonadal and the adrenal and then have good mobility. But then if you injured it, you're obligated to repair it. Whereas if you leave it in place and you still have enough mobility, if there's a big rent in it for whatever reason, then you can just ligate it as long as you're between the collaterals and the cava. All right, so here's an example how to do that. You just kind of lift it out of the way. I use a renal vein retractor, uh, hence the name. Uh, and then you can have usually good exposure of the juxtarenal segment. Um, when you get in, sometimes the lumbar vessels bleed pretty briskly. Somebody taught me a cool trick where you take the shot off a rubber shot and kind of stick it in there, and then you can do whatever you want, repair it. Uh, what they didn't tell me is you're supposed to take them out. I'm like, well, they're sterile, leave it in. I got in quite a bit of trouble for that, so take them out afterwards. Uh, all right, pop quiz. Dating myself with this reference. All right, you clamp the right common iliac artery. Suddenly, there's profound bleeding coming from under your clamp. What happened, and what do you do? Okay, so you, you hit what? Which iliac vein? Probably, yeah. And what do you do? Clamp the artery? Excellent, yeah. So you want to divide the artery. Most of the time, if you're clamping the artery, you're probably going to be suturing to it anyway. But it's nearly impossible to get a view of the iliac vein under the artery unless you divide the artery. So have no feet, and arteries are easy to repair. Even if you weren't going to bypass there, it's very easy to repair. So that's very good. Oh, know that. So here, this is an artist who got it wrong. That This is not the anatomy. The, the aorta is not directly on top of the cava. So usually if you have a right-sided um, common iliac artery injury, it's overlying the left iliac vein. Um, but it depends, you know, anatomy is variable, but in the most cases you'll get that. That's why you get May-Thurner syndrome. All right, when you're done, close up the sac as best as you can. You want to put a barrier between your aorta and your, and your duodenum, you know, so you, hopefully you don't get a recurrence or an aorta duodenal fistula. So this will be the hot topic I'm going to present next year, I'm sure. Um, more dated references. Um, special considerations, when do you re-implant your IMA? Uh, basically, we say if you have pulse-style back bleeding, you probably don't have to. If you have no back bleeding, you probably don't have to. It's that kind of indeterminate, kind of uh, sluggish back bleeding. 
But basically, I just put the IMA to the side, do whatever I do, take a good look at the colon afterwards. And if we have any question whatsoever, we just reimplant it. It's not very difficult to do, um, especially if you have celiac or SMA stenosis. Uh, so you, we used to see these questions a lot on exams. What do you do if you have cholelithiasis and a AAA? And the answer is you don't worry about the cholelithiasis. The incidence of that converting cholecystitis is pretty rare. Colorectal tumor with a AAA, what do you do? and you fix whatever is most life-threatening. So if the, colorect if the tumor, colonic tumor, is obstructing, perforated, bleeding, you fix that first. If not, you probably fix the AAA. Now with EVARs, we can kind of stage them a little more closely. We used to have to stage them about a month apart. Um, you know, intraoperative care, a lot of the stuff is like trauma. You're going to transfuse a lot if you have to, especially in a rupture. You want to keep them warm. They will go into coagulopathy very quickly afterwards unless you warm them up. Post-op, all the stuff we used to do, NG tube, I kept in for a day or two. Some people like to take it out right away. Um, the one thing I will tell you that's different about AAA uh, management than other uh, aortic uh, post-op care, especially like an aorta bifem for um, occlusive disease, is AAAs get uh, DVTs far more frequently. So you do have to be careful of DVT and PE in this population, whereas our peripheral vascular disease population doesn't get it as often. And then follow up, you know, the old days we say, oh, you never have to follow them up, and that's the benefit. But it's a good idea to keep an eye on these people. They do develop other problems down the road. Uh, what's that? Uh, inflammatory. So if you see that rind, you want to take special care. So if you get in and you're, you're facing an inflammatory aneurysm, hopefully you're doing it endo. But if you have to do it open, you have to take special care because the duodenum will be attached to the, the, the rind and you don't want to try to mobilize the duodenum off or you'll end up tearing it. So you actually kind of carve out the, uh, the aneurysm sac around the duodenum and leave the duodenum attached to it. Um, but most of the time, even if you fix this endo, the, that retroperitoneal fibrosis will regress over time. Um, and so that can involve the ureter and the duodenum. But again, even with endo repair, that usually regresses. What's that? Good, horseshoe kidney. So in the old days, before everybody got CAT scan, we'd get the occasional surprise horseshoe kidney, and that was always fun. But the things to know about the horseshoe kidneys is the perfusion is not just from the renal arteries. Uh, it's, it's a segmental perfusion, especially if you have a large isthmus directly from the aorta. So you can't really mobilize these off the aorta because they're often their blood supply is right there on the anterior surface of the aorta. So hopefully you have a way of getting around this or you're doing this endo. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, venal cava configurations. The main thing to be sure of is that if you have a retroaortic renal vein and you go in and clamp, you're aware of it and you don't kind of accidentally rip it. Uh, the most common anomaly is ac actually the circumaortic renal vein where you have an anterior, so then you're like, well, okay, fine, but there's also a posterior one, and so that's actually the most dangerous. If you don't see an anterior vein, then you're suspicious of it, but sometimes there will be both. If the last thing is rupture, um, I get a lot of times the residents say, oh, this aorta looks funny. And most of the time, funny aortas are ruptured aortas. So if you see something like this, this is not, you know, as somebody told me, laminated thrombus in an aorta. This is a rupture. So if you see something really crazy, abnormal looking, suspect that it's ruptured. These are signs that I've only seen in textbooks and on exams. I've never seen one in reality. Um, so good luck with that. My talk for next year will be on conversational Latin, so it can go even more viral. And thank you all very much.